Okay, uh, welcome to this uh, session of uh, e-learning. I'm Dr. Prem Shekhar, and I'm uh, I bring you greetings from uh, Kaveri Hospital in uh, Chennai, India. And uh, the topic today is um, congenital pulmonary stenosis diagnosis and management, including balloon pulmonary valvuloplasty. Uh, so over the next uh, 30 minutes or so, we'll be uh, going through the uh, this topic. I've kept it kind of uh, interactive, so rather than uh, didactic. So um, uh, I would expect a lot of uh, participation from you as we go on. There are quizzes, and that's how we're going to cover the topic. Okay. So, when we talk about congenital pulmonary stenosis, um, we commonly presume that we are referring to the pulmonary valve, uh, whereas it is not really so. When we say congenital pulmonary stenosis, we allude to the entire outflow tract, the right ventricular outflow tract, uh, the pulmonary valve, and the pulmonary artery. So any narrowing in any of these parts would be called as congenital pulmonary stenosis. They can be together or they can be um, separate entities. Estimated incidence is 1 in 2,000 births, so fairly common, so we tend to come across it fairly frequently in our practice. And depending on the morphological location of the narrowing in relation to the pulmonary valve, we can categorize it as being supravalvar when it's distal to the pulmonary valve, uh, valvular or subvalvular when it's in the infundibular part of the right ventricular. So uh, this is my first quiz. Look at this X-ray and identify one important feature that could aid in diagnosing the underlying cardiac pathology. I need you to answer. Look at it carefully and tell me what one feature would tell you what the underlying cardiac pathology is. Saurabhi Das says decreased pulmonary flow. Any other? Comments? Look at the study, the x-ray carefully. Tell me, tell me what you think the underlying cardiac diagnosis is. What is the diagnosis? If you see an x-ray like this, what would you think the underlying cardiac pathology is? None forthcoming. So the pulmonary vascularity is actually, I wouldn't say it's decreased. Um, is there any dilatations of any of the cardiac structure here that would give a clue? Rajesh Kumar says right pulmonary artery is dilated. So you are obviously thinking that this is a case of pulmonary stenosis with 
postnotic dilatation. Am I right? Yeah, so that's what you're thinking. This is not a case of pulmonary stenosis. This one is a case of pulmonary stenosis with a characteristic postenotic dilatation. The reason I put up that x-ray was that you should never jump to conclusions. You should always go about examining the patient in the order that you should and with an open mind just because the topic today is pulmonary stenosis, you should not assume that whatever I'm showing is related to pulmonary stenosis. So that was a mitral stenosis X-ray where the dilatation is of the left atrium. The pulmonary bay is concave, the, and you can see pulmonary hilar congestion on both sides. The left atrial out is prominent and this in comparison is a child with pulmonary stenosis where you see a characteristic enlargement of the pulmonary artery and the pulmonary vascularity unless it's very severe tends to be fairly normal in most cases. So this is an example of how you should approach any with a, any investigations or any clinical examination with an open mind, don't go with a uh, preemptive, pre, uh, pre-judged ideas. Okay, so if you look at the ECG in a child with uh, pulmonary stenosis, what are the features that you would expect? Right ventricular hypertrophy, yes. So you would have an ECG which shows <coughs> a right axis deviation, right atrial dilatation in very severe cases. You can have an incomplete right bundle branch block which is predominantly due to the right ventricular hypertrophy and uh, intraventricular conduction block. You can have pure R waves in the right-sided leads in severe cases of pulmonary stenosis with associated strain pattern, ventricular strain pattern in the right-sided leads. Right. So that is simple. Uh, also, another interesting fact is that if you have pure R waves, if you measure the length in millimeters and multiply it by a factor of five, you can roughly get an estimate of the uh, RV pressure. Uh, so in this case, if you look at this, this is like 10, 12, 12 uh, millimeters into five the RV pressure would be around 60. So that would give you an idea from the ECG about how severe the pulmonary stenosis is. When the stenosis is in the pulmonary arteries, it can be classified into type one when it involves the main pulmonary artery, type two when it involves the bifurcations, type three when there are multiple peripheral stenosis beyond the hilum, and type four, when it's a combination of central and peripheral stenosis. So that would also come under the category of pulmonary stenosis. Now let's look at this case scenario. We have a two day old neonate has been referred to you for a murmur evaluation. You check the saturation and it's 99% in room air. The baby is comfortable at rest, not this neat. You do an examination and you find that the S1 and S2 are normal. The S2 split is normal. There's no ejection click. There's a harsh three by six ejection systolic murmur over the pulmonary area, which is radiating to the back. 
what other examination would substantiate your diagnosis or uh, eliminate other conditions? With this picture, what one other thing would you want to rule out? Clinically. A harsh three by six ejection systolic murmur over the pulmonary area radiating to the back. What will be your thinking? What are the conditions that you need to rule out? No dysmorphic features. No dysmorphic features. Normal looking baby. Okay, so you look at the femoral pulses and you find that they are normal, well felt femoral pulses. Your saturation is 99% in room air. You do a chest x ray and you see CTR of 55%, which is normal for a today old. Lung vascularity is normal. ECG QRS of 120, which is again consistent with the today old baby's ECG. Any ideas at this time as to what the diagnosis is? A healthy, comfortable looking, non dysmorphic baby with a harsh murmur in the pulmonary area radiating to the back, saturating normally with a normal ECG and X ray consistent with the baby's age. Physiological pulmonary stenosis. That's absolutely right. So you do an echocardiography and that confirms that the PFO is shunting left to right and uh, there is flow acceleration across one or either branch PA origin with usually a gradient from 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury. And uh, important to rule out a coarctation of iota in this scenario. So what causes a physiological pulmonary stenosis? What is the reason for a physiological pulmonary stenosis? Adaptation to increase the flow, uh, increase flow compared to normal branch PAs. Yeah, it's basically the the, uh, the the change in the direction of the blood flow that causes it. When you in antenatally you have a large um, ductal arch, uh, which um, allows the blood to go into the descending aorta, and postnatally when the duct starts closing, the blood has to kind of take a 90 degree turn into the branch PAs, which are not um, adjusted to the higher flow. So that turbulence is what is transmitted as a, as a uh, nice uh, uh, focal murmur in the pulmonary area, which is better heard over the back. Uh, so usually tends to be self-limiting. You just need to reassure and uh, review the baby at three to four months of age clinically, at which time the mama would have spontaneously resolved as the uh, branch PAs adjust to the flow. Now, looking at the associations of pulmonary stenosis, what, uh, even though they are rare, what comes to mind? What is the commonest association? that you would expect in a child with pulmonary stenosis. Congenital rubella, okay. 
Nunans, Williams, Tetralogy of Fallow, Rubella exposure, as she rightly said, Patiently Down syndrome, Ehlers Danlos, Allegil syndrome, when you have peripheral PS, 22Q deletion, and single ventricle. So these are all associations which are rare. Okay, so look at this lateral right ventriculogram and comment on it. I want you to notice that the valve, pulmonary valve, is doming and mildly thickened. And you see a prominent postenotic dilatation. You see the iota filling in levophase, which suggests that the interventricular septum is intact. So this is, there's no VST associated. So what causes the postenotic dilatation? What is the reason for the postenotic segment to dilate? Jet effect, right. So, is it always present in all cases of pulmonary stenosis? No, that's correct. So, what are the conditions where you would have pulmonary stenosis but no postenotic dilatation? critical PS, that's right, and in dysplastic valves, as one of the participants said, yes, rubella, which is usually associated with syndromes like rubella and Noonan's, where the valve tends to be very thick and myxomatous. So in a doming valve, in this case scenario, you see a valve which is fairly pliable and doming. So here the stenosis um, uh, uh, the, uh, the pathology is due to fusion of the valve cusp margins and the central aperture becomes small. Whereas in syndromic associations, the valve itself is commonly tricommissural, but tends to be thickened and that limits the mobility of the valve, causing a stenosis. So it's important to differentiate that by echocardiography because uh, those kind of valves are not commonly amenable for a successful balloon pulmonary valvuloplasty. So this is an right ventriculogram, which shows an extreme form of pulmonary stenosis amounting to atresia. Can also be called membranous pulmonary atresia and it's a tripartite right ventricle. You see outlet, you see an inlet, and you see a well-formed apex. So what would be the line of management and why? Yes, percutaneous sudipta is right, percutaneous pulmonary valve perforation. You can't do a balloon dilatation straight away with a well-formed tripartite RV like this. You 
uh, going down the two ventricle line of management. So the option is to perforate the pulmonary valve and then do, once you perforate it with whatever means, then you do serial dilatations with balloons until you achieve an effective outflow. So can you tell me the hardware that have been used for this perforation of the pulmonary valve in membranous pulmonary atresia? List them in the order that they have been used. Micro catheter, radio frequency catheter. Okay, uh, but before the radio frequency catheters, what were what was uh, used in the early 90s? What was the very first uh, um, modality that was used to perforate such atretic pulmonary valves? Early 90s. So the very first report was of using laser. Laser was used to perforate the uh, uh, the pulmonary valve in 1991. Soon after, there was a report of using a stiff end of a guide wire to perforate such membranous pulmonary atresia. And only after that, radio frequency came into vogue in 1992. Which of these modalities is the most efficient of the three? Laser straight tip or radio frequency? Yes, radio frequency is the most uh, successful, obviously, and that is what is being used of late. Uh, with the steerable radio frequency catheters, the success rate is almost as high as 100%. Whereas with um, the laser, the reported uh, success rate was about 80%, with stiff end of a guide wire, about 60%. Uh, so, Steerable RF catheter is the most efficient. What additional percutaneous catheter based intervention may be necessary once you have opened up the RVOT? Ductal stenting, that's right. Okay, so look at this uh, angiogram. This is a uh, again a neonate, two days old, right ventriculogram shows a well formed RBOT. What is this condition? And what are the auscultatory findings in this condition? Yeah. 
Yeah, so this is critical. This is not pulmonary atresia. Uh, as uh, you can see, Rajesh Kumar is right. He's, uh, this is critical pulmonary stenosis because you see a tiny jet of blood coming through the valve uh, into the uh, pulmonary artery, pacifying the pulmonary arteries. So when you auscultate, you would find no murmur. Okay, uh, is that right? Will you find absolutely no murmur? Is there a possibility that you can find, uh, you, you can have a murmur? And if so, from where? You would not have a pulmonary murmur. You would not have a pulmonary flow murmur. You can have a soft PSM, which could be coming from the tricuspid valve regurgitation in such situations. So yes, uh, so you can have a murmur, but it would not be a pulmonary flow murmur, a pulmonary ejection systolic murmur. And what about the heart sounds? Single S2, because the pulmonary component will not be present, correct? And what about the split? Could be paradoxical. Yeah. If you have an um, not in this case, but if you have like a child with pulmonary stenosis and you have an additional S3 audible, what could that indicate? Yeah, if you have an RBS3, RB failure, what, what could that indicate? Apart from RB failure, what could that indicate? I'm not talking about a neonate, I'm talking about an older child, not necessarily this case. An older child with pulmonary stenosis, additionally having an S3. What is an S3 due to? non-compliant RV, stiff RV, okay. So an S3 may indicate an associated ASD or PAPVC, which may be load, uh, volume loading the right ventricle. So in that scenario, you can have an S3. If you have very severe pulmonary stenosis and high RA pressure, then you can have additionally an S4-2. So it's important to listen to the heart sounds very carefully as well as the mama. So what is the very first line of management in this baby here? So you have done this, uh, you have, this is the kind of, this is the, you have diagnosed critical pulmonary stenosis by echocardiography and PGE1, um, yeah. Okay, so you start prostaglandin to keep the duct open and uh, the preferred method of relieving the outflow obstruction here. Could be a BPV. Say you're not able to do a pulmonary uh, uh, balloon valvuloplasty and the baby has to be managed surgically. What would be the preferred surgical interventions required for a good outcome? What would you do surgically? Say there is no provision to do a balloon pulmonary valvuloplasty in such a small baby, you have to send the baby to the surgeon. So what recommendations would you give to the surgeon for a good outcome in this baby? Shunt operation? Just the shunt operation? What about the RV outflow tract? You have to do a pulmonary surgical valvotomy plus a shunt uh, operation. Okay. So you have to do a valvotomy and uh, not just leave it with the valvotomy, but do a shunt operation. Okay. So This is the same baby. 
anti-grade balloon pulmonary valvuloplasty is not very easy because of the eccentric positioning of the valve aperture. Sometimes it may not be central, it may be eccentric and uh, the size of the valve. Uh, also, you may need special catheters or sometimes a uh, Swan Gans catheter with the balloon inflated which can help you center the catheter towards the central aperture through which you can pass a guide wire. As you can see here, we have passed the guide wire in, but it may be difficult to get the wire well in and pass another catheter through because of the huge size of the right atrium and a very easily excitable right ventricle which could be uh, causing all kinds of arrhythmias. So if you can't cross it, is there any other alternative available to circumvent these problems and do a successful balloon pulmonary valvuloplasty? You have taken this baby to the cath lab. You have done this angiogram and you are trying to cross it from the RV. You, are, you can get a wire in, but you can't get your catheter across. So, because you are getting multiple hemodynamically uh, significant ventricular tachycardias. Through PDA. So, you go the retrograde route. Yeah, because you are, the baby is on prostaglandin and uh, you can go through a PDA and do a balloon pulmonary valvuloplasty. So look at this angiogram where a BPV is being done. What balloon do you think that is? This baby weighs about 2.83 kilos. What balloon is that and what is the wire? Tyshak Mini, that's right. So Tyshak Mini can go, what is the wire used? O14 coronary wire, yes. So a Tyshak Mini can go on a O14 uh, coronary wire through a four trench uh, guiding catheter, right coronary guiding catheter. And uh, apart from the fact that uh, the balloon was not very well prepared, this went quite successfully and that's the end result where you have a good opening. So you have done this and uh, the cyanosis dramatically resolves immediately after the BPV, true or false? This baby was saturating like say 70% before the procedure. The PFO was shunting right to left. And you do the BPV, will the saturation go up to 95, 96 immediately? Why? Restrictive tricuspid valve physiology? No. The RV is hypertrophied and non compliant. Yeah, so the RV is non compliant and is unable to accommodate the uh, right sided venous return. So uh, you would still have a right to left shunt across the PFO. The cyanosis would persist, but not to the extent that you need to uh, do a BT shunt or anything like that. You just have to wait for the RV to become compliant over a period of time. 
how long would you keep the prostaglandin infusion going post BPV? Saurabhi Das says we can stop prostaglandin immediately. I wouldn't do that. They would keep it going for some time till the saturations improve, and uh, that could take about 24 to 48 hours. So it's it's worth keeping it uh, on uh, until the saturation until the RV becomes more compliant. Uh, you ca you can't expect the baby to go home with a saturation of 96 percent. You would uh, discharge the baby in a couple of days time with the saturation of uh, in the 70s or uh, uh, high uh, 80s and um, uh, this, this uh, RV uh, compliance may take even as long as uh, three to six months before uh, the uh, interatrial shunt uh, stops uh, if the PFO continues to remain uh, patent. So let's go to a slide which is all about BPV. Um, static BPV first described by who and in which year? Fill in the blanks. When was it first described? No idea. Hmm, put it grandma. Okay. No idea. I hope you are not Googling now. It was uh, described by by Can and his associates in 1982. And um, yeah, so so what was done? Any idea what was done before static BPV was uh, described? The procedure for relieving pulmonary stenosis percutaneously before static BPV was to do a balloon inflated pullback uh, dilatation by stem. So BPV is indicated when the peak to peak gradient exceeds what? What is the number? What uh, millimeters of mercury should it exceed before you consider taking a child for a balloon pulmonary valvuloplasty? Good. Ideal balloon to pulmonary annulus ratio is hundred to hundred and twenty percent. So normally it's yeah, uh, hundred and twenty to hundred and twenty five. And what's the ideal balloon length in an older child? Or any child, two to four, ideally three. BPV with double balloon gives better result than BPV with single balloon, true or false? Amit Kumar says true. Anybody disagree with him? So there are studies which show that uh, using a double balloon does not give you a better result. Uh, 
uh, it's only when it doesn't give you a better result. Um, it uh, it only gives you uh, a better result when you cannot achieve the 1.2 or 125 percent ratio uh, with a single balloon in an older patient. Uh, so uh, apart from that, it, uh, using a double balloon does not give you a better result than using a single balloon when you can achieve a 125 percent ratio. So what is the percentage of restenosis? Thirty is too high. It's about ten percent done properly. And what are the immediate post procedure indicators which can tell you that this child could come back? Immediate post procedure indicators. Residual gradient of how much? A residual gradient of 30. 30 mm HG is an indicator that uh, the child could uh, come back. Also, a balloon to pulmonary ratio of less than 1.2 is an indicator for restenosis. What is the procedure of choice for managing restenosis? Procedure of choice. Amit Kumar says surgery and he's wrong. The procedure of choice is again a balloon dilatation with a balloon where you can achieve a ratio of 1.2 to 1.25. So the procedure of choice for managing the stenosis is again balloon dilatation only and not surgery. Now look at these balloon dilatations as I told you started from the early 80s. So before the 80s, what do you think was done to relieve uh, pulmonary stenosis? It's a surgical procedure. So what, what surgical procedure was done and who was the person who pioneered it? Amit Kumar is honest, he says no idea. So, this is um, uh, uh, pioneered by a surgeon called uh, Sir uh, Russell Brock in uh, 1947. He uh, relieved the RBOT obstruction by surgically resecting it. Subsequently, he did pulmonary valvotomy plus RBOT resection, and uh, that came to be known as Brock's procedure. Do you know what was used to do the Brock's procedure? It's, a, it's not an open heart surgery, it's a closed heart procedure. Any idea as to what uh, was the instrument that was used to do Brock's procedure? Probably not. So Brock's procedure is a surgical technique for correction of pulmonary stenosis in which there is excision of the fibromuscular obstruction in the right ventricle using what is called a rongeur. The rongeur is a French word which means a rodent. This is a, uh, used for cutting bones, a surgical instrument used for cutting bones shaped like a rodent. And this is blindly inserted through the wall of the right ventricle and the right ventricular outflow tract is excised. So it's a, it's a pretty crude and bloody technique. This is the description of Ronger. It's a strongly constructed instrument with a sharp edged scoop shaped tip 
used for gouging out bone. Ronger is a French word that means rodent or gnaw. So this instrument, which is used, a steel instrument, which is used for gouging out bone, was introduced into the right ventricular outflow tract, and whatever was in the way of the right ventricular outflow tract was gouged out. So this was not a very popular uh, surgery, and uh, the uh, consequences were severe pulmonary regurgitations, uh, sometimes uh, sudden cardiac death, secondary to pulmonary regurgitations, and uh, the pulmonary hypertension when there was associated VSDs. Uh, this is Lord Russell Brock, and on the right you see the Ronger. Okay, let's quickly move on to this angiogram. What is what is the diagnosis and what is the um, embryological explanation for this? What is the diagnosis here? This is the right ventriculogram in PA view. <clears throat> Maybe a little cranial tilt. Double chambered right ventricle is correct. So what is the embryological explanation for double chambered right ventricle? you have two chambers you have a proximal chamber which is formed from the sinus portion of the right ventricle and a distal chamber which constitutes the infundibulum of the right ventricle and you have a thick band of muscle in between which separates these two what are we mid cavity muscle bundle hypertrophy with a Okay, so this is an anomalous muscle bundle, which um, <clears throat> there are few theories floating around. One is that it's uh, it's an um, incomplete incorporation of the primitive bulbous cordis uh, into the RV cavity. The the uh, infundibular part of the right ventricle uh, up uh, up to the sinus part of the uh, the pulmonary valve forms from the bulbous cordis, and uh, this could be due to incomplete uh, resorption of the bulbous cordis into the right ventricle. The other theory is that it's commonly associated with ventricular septal defects. And uh, this jet, the ventricular high velocity jet, may be hitting the parietal wall and inducing hyperfibrosis and hypertrophy of the parietal muscle bundle, causing an partitioning of the right ventricle into two. So, what would be the management for that? RVOT muscle resection. And many a times the surgeon would not be able to identify the VST because the RV is so hypertrophy, the uh, VST may not be uh, visible um, from the, uh, 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 for, the, for the surgeon to close it. Okay, so this is a, a, a seven month old uh, baby who presented, who ha had tetralogy of fallow and uh, presented with severe right ventricular failure, a huge heart on x-ray, 
very dysfunctional non contractile right ventricle dilated right ventricle and very severe right ventricular outflow tract obstruction as you can see a very thin streak of blood going across the right ventricular outflow tract and this is the angiogram uh, pigtail in the right ventricle from the uh, across the VST and you see a very tight infundibular stenosis with well formed uh, PA confluence. What would be your line of management in this condition where there is very severe right ventricular outflow tract obstruction causing RV failure? How would you manage this child? Ensuring a good outcome. Because if you can see the, the heart is huge. If you can see the angio picture, the heart is huge. The RA is hugely dilated and uh, the heart looks globular, severe cardiomegaly and poorly contractile RV with LV function affected because of the RV dilatation and interventricular dependence. So how would you manage this child? Would you send the child to surgery? Amit Kumar says BT shunt. Any surgical intervention would be a very high risk procedure. Any surgical intervention would be a high risk procedure in this child. So this is what was done with a very good successful outcome, immediate uh, uh, improvement in the uh, symptomatology of the child. RBOT stenting by Riyanka Gupta, that's great. So this is exactly what was done. You see a stent, coronary stent, which was put in the RBOT just proximal to the pulmonary valve. So the pulmonary valve has not been incorporated into the stent, which is important because in this case, the pulmonary valve was competent and uh, only the thick RV outflow tract stenosis was relieved with the stent. The child showed significant improvement over the next couple of days and has gone home to come back later for further surgical palliation. So now quickly moving on to peripheral pulmonary stenosis. What is the embryological basis of peripheral pulmonary stenosis? You see an angiogram here where you see multiple, uh, the one on the right shows the, the picture, entire picture much better. You see multiple hilar uh, stenosis bilaterally. So this is a child with Williams syndrome, obviously and multiple peripheral stenosis. What is the embryological basis for this? So the peripheral, the pulmonary arteries developed from distal lung beds, that's correct. So these distal lung beds, that's, uh, it, these pulmonary arteries are in close association with the, uh, with the vascular, pulmonary vascular plexus. Um, and uh, these are in close association with the lung buds and uh, sometimes loss of elastic tissue in these can cause this kind of uh, multiple peripheral uh, stenosis. So how would you manage this condition? Cutting balloon angioplasty, that's right. Balloon dilatation will not work, as Amit Kumar says. Balloon dilatation, because these are all very um, thick walled uh, distal pul uh, pulmonary arteries, uh, which may not yield uh, to uh, uh, a sustained uh, um, uh, uh, dilatation. So you need to do cutting balloon angioplasty which is and uh, this has to be done serially in multiple sites wherever you uh, find uh, the stenosis you have to cross each and every branch and uh, painstakingly uh, dilate them with a cutting balloon and follow them up 
uh, and it may require serial balloon dilatations. So this is uh, post cutting balloon dilatation on both sides. You don't see a dramatic in, in, uh, dif difference in the pulmonary vasculature because these are all, like I said, very thick walled uh, 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 structures and uh, you, the, the increased flow is expected to allow uh, the somatic growth in uh, times to come and hopefully they will grow better. And this is uh, the same child where an iatogram showed a very severe supravalvar uh, stenosis, childhood Williams syndrome. And you can see the coronaries are ectatic too because of the severe supravalvar stenosis. Okay, we are coming to the last slide, good. So having talked all about uh, balloon pulmonary valvuloplasty in um, children postnatally, uh, this is fetal balloon pulmonary valvuloplasty and uh, what are the indications that would uh, warrant a fetal balloon pulmonary valvuloplasty. Hypoplastic RB is an effect of a stenosed pulmonary valve. What are the conditions that would make you intervene early to do a fetal balloon? RB failure, critical PS. So basically, you see a fetal heart which has a very high cardiothoracic, uh, cardiothoracic ratio or you see pericardial effusion developing or if you see tricuspid regurgitation which is extending on into uh, diastole or if there is abnormal venous dopplers, these are all the indications when you would uh, go ahead and do a fetal balloon pulmonary valvuloplasty and at what gestational age would you ideally undertake these? Yeah, it's about 21 to 30 weeks, yeah, 21 to 30 weeks. And how is the stenotic valve accessed? How do you, how do you access the stenotic valve? Trans umbilical, that's interesting. Yeah, trans placental. So you don't go trans umbilical, you go trans placental. So um, directly uh, uh, you you um, go through the maternal uh, abdomen uh, into the amniotic sac with a steel needle and uh, you give maternal sedation. So that would keep the baby quiet as well. Uh, it's very important for the baby to be in a good position, amenable position for you to stick the needle into the baby's uh, chest through the uh, maternal abdomen. And uh, uh, you, uh, using a steel needle, you just get into the chamber that is obstructed and, uh, and uh, do the procedure. So, what are the hardwares used? So, the hardware is used, the, the steel needle that's used is usually a 16 or 18 gauge um, long needle. And uh, you uh, just uh, after entering the amniotic sac, before you enter the baby's uh, uh, chest, uh, you could inject a little bit of uh, analgesia and then poke through the uh, chest into the RV cavity through the uh, 
uh, the steel needle, you would uh, introduce a O14 coronary wire, guide it across the pulmonary valve, and uh, then put a, a coronary balloon, usually about two centimeters long and uh, three to four mm uh, in diameter across the pulmonary valve, do a balloon pulmonary valvuloplasty and come out. Okay, so that finishes this presentation. And uh, these are all some of the references that were taken to compile this presentation. I hope you uh, enjoyed it and it was useful. And uh, all the best. Thank you. If there are any questions, then I can take it now.